Thanks. Um, I decided to go full old school and there won't be any uh, PowerPoints. And I should say, I have uh, also never been on Twitter. Don't ever want to be on Twitter. <laughs> well, I won't read it because I don't. <laughs> so I thought I would start. Um, it strikes me uh, a little historical context. And it fits well uh, to start with the Russell Sage Foundation. Uh, Russell Sage was a railroad robber baron, much like Leland Stanford. Um, I don't know enough. Maybe Stanford gave his money away. But uh, Russell Sage never would have. He was known as particularly um, uh, abstemious. abstemious. Thank you, Michael. I was going to say, I was trying to avoid saying something worse. Um, but his wife, Margaret Olivia Sage, when he died, uh, was the richest woman in America. Two things about that. In today's terms, uh, she had about $6 billion. That made her the richest woman in America. That today, I don't think, even gets you on the top 100 list. Uh, but it was an era of uh, a gilded age of inequality. And what's quite remarkable is she gave away all the money um, to environmental causes, uh, to women's uh, suffragette, women's education. And the Russell Sage Foundation had the mandate, quote, uh, the improvement of social and living conditions in the United States. So she was very progressive. Uh, and so it's, it's actually um, interesting uh, to think about where we are now that we're in another gilded age uh, of inequality. And I think um, she would certainly be pleased that the Russell Sage Foundation is still following her mandate to focus on improving social and living conditions in the United States. But I think she would be shocked if she were alive today if she heard the discussion from the previous authors today, the authors in the volume who didn't show up today. Uh, but a, a, a theme throughout uh, this issue is uh, the extent uh, of inequalities in uh, many dimensions. The other thing, and this leads actually into the piece that I've prepared is that uh, she was very much part of a progressive movement. And in its early days, uh, the Russell Sage Foundation funded uh, people who did research on and advocated against child labor. Uh, and there were actually payday loans. Uh, somebody sent me a video that was made, a silent movie, uh, uh, around 1920, warning workers not to get um, payday loans. And it's one in which uh, a family has the people come in and take the bed away from the sick child uh, because they've taken out uh, these payday loans. So some things uh, haven't changed. And what I talk about in my paper, I think she would be surprised that instead of having progressive policies, to, uh, to, to improve social and living conditions in the United States, that at least in this particular policy slice, what we have are uh, a series of regressive policies. Uh, and this ad administration is, I think, unlike any one, at least in, um, that I can think of, uh, going back to um, uh, the Great Depression that generated uh, Social Security, unemployment insurance, welfare, uh, and lots of other policies. Um, when, when I was a young scholar, I guess when I was a millennial, it was the Reagan era. And uh, at the time, I thought Nixon was terrible and, and the Reagan budget cuts were awful. But in retrospect, they're really nothing uh, like what we're seeing today. So um, let me talk a little bit about uh, the policies that are in, um, in the report I wrote. 
when Mike Hout commented on uh, the upward mobility of being a university professor, uh, I was sort of reminded, gee, it's much better to be a foundation president. Because when I was a university professor, if I got up here, I would have been worried they're streaming it. Some political appointee at HHS is going to see what I say, and they're going to yank the federal grants from my research center at Michigan, and I'm going to have to lay off staff uh, because I was so glib uh, on an afternoon in California. Now I don't have to worry about that. Uh, so if there's a subtitle to my talk, which is just listed as policy, um, it's really the failure of public policies. And if I would think of a soundbite, um, when Clinton was running uh, for president, James Carville came up with the soundbite, it's the economy, stupid. Um, and now, at this particular time, when the economy is quite good, uh, unemployment is low, inflation is low, uh, it's, I, I would say the sound bite is, it's the public policy, stupid. Um, it's key that a lot of the issues are related to slow growth and rising inequality that have been mentioned today, that many, many of the issues face, uh, that face the millennials that we've talked about, face other people. So, you know, the baby boomers are, uh, uh, in, in Mario Small's quote, you know, the people who got jobs with pensions uh, stayed on those jobs for a long period of time and are doing uh, relatively well. Uh, well, even among the baby boomers, uh, there are those of us, university professors, et cetera, who still have those jobs and pensions, but there are a lot of auto workers who lost their jobs before they had pensions. and. Uh, the previous generation, uh, the war on poverty's increase in Social Security benefits really dramatically reduced poverty among the elderly. But if you look at it, there are many baby boomers 60 years old who don't have much pensions uh, and are likely uh, to have a higher probability of poverty in the future. So a lot of these issues of slow growth, lack of pensions, um, who lost their homes during um, uh, the recession. Derek clearly pointed out uh, the black-white differences, but if you look among whites, uh, they're real differences by class as well. So many of the issues, uh, I guess I would argue, there are uh, uh, greater commonalities across uh, generations than um, be because of this increasing inequality. Um, the factors, I think, are well known, uh, and I, th I would not try to put, let's take 100% of the problems and allocate them 10% to this or 10% of that, but uh, globalization, labor-saving technological changes, slower growth in the supply of skilled workers, declining union membership, declining labor bargaining power, the failure of the federal government to maintain the real wage, Indeed, just this morning, my wife pointed out a headline that Bernie Sanders was, I guess, talking to the CEO of Walmart, who made $24 million last year, and the CEO of Walmart publicly announces that we ought to raise the minimum wage. So these are unusual times. Walmart, apparently, this is the article I read this morning in the hotel, has a minimum wage of $11 an hour, but he's arguing that, obviously, the Fed's uh, should raise it. It used to be um, uh, one was was to the left of center if one advocated raising the minimum wage. But when the head of Walmart does, you know public policies um, are not uh, very progressive. Uh, changing corporate practices, including the explosion of CEO pay, business-friendly uh, deregulation in Congress and even Democratic administrations pro-business Supreme Court uh, decisions and persistent race and gender discrimination. And um, I would just add, um, since when they cut me off, you can read what I have to say in, in the issue, I'll, so I'll bring in some extra things. I was reminded uh, in hearing um, Kim and Derek and others talk about um, 
racial discrimination. Rucker Johnson of Berkeley has a new book on the positive benefits of reducing school uh, segregation and of federal government payments to reduce black-white spending gaps in school. And um, again, there were, the reason I brought it up now is pro-business Supreme Court decisions, but also anti-integration uh, interest. Rucker puts a lot of blame on Supreme Court decisions uh, that allowed resegregation of schools. Uh, one only has to think about Citizens United uh, and business, uh, Supreme Court decisions and obviously voting rights, a lot of things that are relevant today that are, are not in my paper. Um, so let me talk a little bit, since I only have five minutes, about giving you just a slice of some of the regressive policies. I think in some ways, this is another example of Mitch McConnell's uh, successful legacy. Uh, because he uh, prevented the Obama administration from achieving the progressive policies that it put, managed to put in place by one vote with the stimulus bill. Somebody in the morning mentioned the stimulus bill and something then that wasn't kept on. But I think the Obama administration thought all right, we got this stimulus bill, and a lot of these things are then going to be made permanent, and they never got anything done, so they did them by executive order, making it a lot easier for the current administration to overturn them um, than it would have been had they actually uh, been legislated. So I'll give some examples. Uh, labor department regulations designed to protect workers from unfair employer practices. Um, uh, this administration has refused to enforce education department regulations designed to protect student borrowers from predatory for-profit colleges. Sue obviously knows a hundred times more about that than I do. Uh, they've made it more difficult to enroll in coverage under the Affordable Care Act, and there was just a recent May 16th blog post from the Center on Budget, Roundup administration efforts to sabotage the Affordable Care Act, and they're, you know, a lot of times these are in the weeds. They hardly get mentioned because there's so many of them, but again, it's doing everything it can. And I guess the, um, so, I'll use Derek's word, the sordid history of the Affordable Care Act is that it provided coverage to millions of people and paid for it with a surtax on people who earn more than $250,000. So it obviously ought to be something uh, that ought to be undermined. It's promoting work tests on food stamp and Medicaid recipients. And again, one of the speakers from the floor uh, mentioned that. Um, so there, we, we're now living in an era where um, there are um, almost anything you can think about. I'll, I'll do one more that was in the news recently, and this one is very wonky. Uh, but um, uh, talk to Chris Weimers about this. Um, poverty line proposal would cut Medicaid, Medicare, and premium tax credits, causing millions to lose or see reduced benefits over time. The administration has proposed a technical change in the update of the poverty measure. Um, I didn't know they were really interested in economic statistics. Uh, but gee, they're doing this. It's just like with the census question, they're doing this because they're interested uh, in uh, voter rights. Uh, so this is a very wonky change in the poverty measure that would um, uh, take millions of people off the rolls. Finally, I'll say one more. It's in my paper. Um, uh, and that is um, something, it's a strange name, uh, the public charge rule. The idea is that if you were here legally as an immigrant and you stop working and you rely on um, welfare, um, uh, you may not be able to become uh, a citizen. And what the administration is trying to do, uh, and there's a footnote in there to some um, 
uh, research by Hiro Yoshikawa at New York University and his uh, colleagues. They want to make it much broader uh, so that if your kid goes to Head Start or gets Medicaid or gets school lunch, then you might not be able to become uh, a citizen. And I'm reminded of this. Uh, when my son was a law student and my daughter-in-law was a medical student and I helped them do their taxes with TurboTax, I was surprised that my granddaughter got the earned income tax credit. Well, that's because they didn't make very much money as students. So in some sense, under, if you use the EITC, my granddaughter would have been a public charge when she was one year old and her parents were students. If you do that, then you say, OK, these people shouldn't become citizens. Well, now my son is a lawyer and my daughter-in-law is a doctor, and we don't have to worry about them being public charges. But the example is important because there are a lot of young immigrants who were here legally. and. Their children are US born in many cases. And so what kind of policy is it that the parents might not to get to be citizens because the kids are going to get these public benefits? So economists are the original dismal scientists. But I will try to end, even though I'm out of time. Um, and I'll also be glib. Um, because I've given Stanford some grants, or rather because the Russell Sage Foundation has, I bet they don't throw me off the stage. <laughs> um, so let me uh, end positively and say there are many examples of evidence-based uh, progressive social policies that Mrs. Sage uh, would appreciate, and we heard some of them today. I mentioned the Russell Sage Foundation has an open access journal. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we published uh, an issue called Anti-Poverty Policy Initiatives for the United States. Uh, Derek had a paper in it. Um, Chris was part of a paper. And so I'll just read you examples. Um, download the free issue in your spare time tonight and read it over the weekend. Um, Universal child allowance, a higher minimum wage, a federal jobs guarantee, community college reforms that would provide skills needed for middle class jobs, food stamp reforms, and other policies. The, the list goes on. Um, they are evidence-based. They are realistic. Um, um, many of them uh, have ways to pay for them. And uh, it's not surprising, I think, that the Affordable Care Act um, uh, isn't uh, liked by Republicans because it raised revenue uh, with this uh, supplemental Medicare tax on high earners. The other thing I would refer to, a National Academy of Science report on reducing child poverty uh, in half by 10 years. Uh, the lead uh, panel member was Greg Duncan. Uh, they carefully evaluated all of the social science evidence. They have a package they recommended expanding the earned income tax credit, expanding uh, child care subsidies, raising the minimum wage, expanding training and employment programs, increasing food stamp benefits for families with children, expanding the housing choice voucher program, and the list goes on. So there are lots of realistic policies. Uh, that will depend on Mitch McConnell uh, not being uh, the head of a sent the, the Senate, uh, which are, um, um, that would be poverty re reducing. And I'll give one example because it's both found in the National Academy of Science report and in work by Chris Weimer and his colleagues, and that is um, simply taking the current child care tax credit and making it refundable uh, would reduce child poverty by about three percentage points. And as an example, and then I'll stop, uh, the worst thing in my view that this administration did was something, do they call it the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017, not the robber barons tax cut of 2017. So it, in general, was, is just terrible. It raises 
inequality of income, it raises inequality of wealth, it reduces mobility, but it did increase the child credit from $1,000 to $2,000. So that was a good thing, but it did it in a regressive way. Uh, it greatly restricted it. So as an example, and this is from the Center on Budget and Policy Priority, um, let me get my facts straight. Eleven million children in low-income working families received an increase of less than $75 because it wasn't fully refundable. Fifteen million children in moderate income families received less than the full $1,000 increase. But because they raised the cap, it used to stop for families at 150,000. So at first, families under the previous policy, families above 150,000 didn't get anything. Now, families uh, above, uh, as long as between 150 and 400 get the full credit. So while the single mother earning the, f the minimum wage, single mother working full-time, full year, earning the minimum wage got $75 extra from this tax credit. A married couple earning $400,000 got an extra $4,000. Thank you.